Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello, you're listening to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio, and you're listening to me, Dab Wolf. I'm the host, and today I'm not bringing on a guest. I've got a lot to talk about on this show today. I know last time, a few weeks ago, I was talking about oh, Christy Nome and how she wrote a book about how proud she was that she shot her adolescent puppy dog, who was a German short-haired pointer, a very good choice for a hunting dog as far as breed goes. And without any training, it failed to do the right thing on a turkey hunt. And then she took it. Obviously, it got its signals confused. Then she took it to visit friends who had chickens and it killed chickens. So she shot it. She also shot a goat. And then after the show aired, she was on TV once again. Only this time, she was saying that if, <laughs> if she got into the White House, the first thing she would do is shoot Biden's dog. And she made jokes about it, saying, you know, he should say hello to Cricket and all this sort of stuff. And, okay, Biden's dog does have a problem. Now, when I said German short-haired pointer is the right dog for a hunting trip, true, German Shepherd might not be the right dog for the White House because there's so many strangers. There's so many strangers who a, do- a good guard dog, a good shepherd dog guarding its flock would think are a danger. Like 200-pound security guards with guns. These guys, they look like threats to a good dog that's not properly trained for this specific task to allow all people in uniform access or whatever else. It's just too big a job for a dog like that. He wants to do the job and they want him to be a pet. And that just can't work. So unless you take your German Shepherd and you put it through an enormous amount of training to teach it, that everybody and anybody is allowed around the president, you're going to have a German Shepherd that's going to protect the president, which I would say is ideal. Anyway, just keep him on a leash and keep him tight, keep him close. Now, even a guard who maybe has bad ideas, maybe been influenced, paid off, maybe a bad apple in the guards, he can't get to you either because the shepherd's on duty. So there's a way to use the German Shepherd in this situation, but letting it run loose on the White House lawn when strange new security guards are coming in and out is not the way. Killing it for this, for this very um, amazing sign of duty. This dog, when he puts himself in front of the president and tries to protect the president against armed men, this dog is going above and beyond. He doesn't deserve to die for that. That loyalty and bravery should be rewarded. He just needs to be put on a leash and trained. That's all. Or put in a different home. Maybe he should stay at Biden's vacation home and not at the White House. I mean, there's a very simple solution to this. But killing the dog is not the solution. In both these cases, there's no reason to kill the dog. The dog is not a bad apple, not a bad canine citizen, not a threat to anybody if he's put in the right situation. So I just wanted to cover that a little bit, talk about that just a little bit. And if you If you can catch Colbert on this, oh my goodness, last week he was, and the week before, he was so funny talking about this. So it's worth catching reruns of that show or looking it up on YouTube. Something else in the news that I found interesting was that New York City is having a terrible, terrible rat problem. You know, most major cities have this problem. And if you're a port city, you have it even worse. So, okay, New York is a big water port. And it's a big, big city. So it's going to have these problems. And most of the rats were actually imports from Europe. Most of these rats are not native to uh, North America. But now they're here and they're reproducing like crazy. And (laughs) New York actually, last year they had a rat czar. This year they're having a rat summit. I think it's really quite interesting. And I know Vancouver, the city I live near, I live in a little town called Maple Ridge in the outskirts of country town, about an hour outside of Vancouver. But Vancouver also has a rat problem, big rat problem. And it's a big city and a port city, beautiful city. So what happens here with the rats? Mm -hmm. Not going to like this. Coyotes. Coyotes flourish on the rat population. And that's not very good for the people who don't want coyotes pestering them, biting them, intimidating them, harassing them, trying to steal their cats or little dogs, picking fights with their big dogs. It's not a good situation at all. 
And I do wonder if we think of this in a more holistic way, if there is a place for felines in rat control. I mean, there's got to be. There's got to be a way to use the uh, cat population that is stray. There's often conflict between the bird lovers and the cat lovers. And the cat people want to have spay and neuter and humane release of these cats to live in colonies, wild colonies. But sometimes the colonies are in the exactly wrong spot, right? They happen to be right where the birds that are endangered are having their young or right where they're mating or right where they fish or some really sensitive area. And then the whole cat population has to be moved, which I totally agree with. How about move them <laughs> where there's too many rats? Now we're talking, right? Because the big thing, I mean, a cat will eat about 10 to 12 rodents in a day easily. And a cat can take down a rat its size. It's amazing to watch. This is what they're made for. So I wonder, I wonder if people ought to be thinking about this a little more. Yes. All right, we're going to go to break and come back and talk about another infestation. Nothing to do with rats. And we're going to go all the way to Japan to talk about this one. Stay tuned on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. This is Deborah Wolf, host of Animal Party on Pet Life Radio. You know the expression, cats have nine lives? Well, what if you can give them one more? The Give Them 10 movement is on a mission to help give cats an extra life. How? With spay and neuter. Spaying or neutering your cat helps them live a longer, healthier life. And it helps control free-roaming cat populations, too. Learn more about the benefits of spay and neuter and meet Scooter, the neutered cat, at GiveThem10.org. That's GiveThemTen.org. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, you're back on Animal Party on Pet Life Radio. Well, has sometimes TV influences us, and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. So in the 70s, there was this cartoon about a happy-go-lucky, mischievous raccoon. And the cartoon didn't do very well in North America. i would never heard of it, but it got so popular in Japan. It was really, really big there. And so people started importing raccoons as pets. And they kept them for a little while, as you might with a baby animal. They're often very easy to deal with when they're infants. But then some of the raccoons got to be problems and the people just, either they escaped or they let them go. Either way, the result is that they ruined a whole bunch of ancient temples. Okay, so that's a few years ago, maybe 20 years ago. This beautiful natural park where you could hike to different temples with the pagoda roofs and pray or look at historical plaques and really immerse yourself in the history of Japan, is now taken over by these raccoons. And the roofs are, you know, chewed apart, and there's feces everywhere, and it's just a horrible, horrible situation. But to make matters worse, now the raccoons are in Tokyo. And I mean, it kind of sounds like, it kind of sounds like one of those movies, you know, where like uh, a big giant lizard takes over, a big gorilla, Hong Kong, you know, King Kong takes over Tokyo. It's like one of those. The raccoons take over Tokyo. So I'd like to see what happens with this because raccoons are unusually difficult to get rid of for a variety of reasons. For one thing, they have their hands have a a digit on them that is an awful lot like our thumb. It's not quite like our thumb, but I might argue it's better (laughs) because it's a little more dexterous and they have those wicked talons, those sharp, sharp claws on on all their fingers. So they have an opposing digit. They can undo things and do them up and unlock gates and latches and probably quicker than you can. Now, I've said that before about some of the dogs at my place. There was a Rottweiler thump years ago who could open any latch with his mouth or his head. All my poodles are very, very good at this with their paws. They can open gates and latches and just watching you do it once or twice. And then the next time they're in the yard alone, they do it themselves. And okay, but raccoons? Raccoons have thumbs. So all of this is super easy. Anything you can do, they can do as far as locking, unlocking, opening, and closing. So that's the first thing. And then they're very, very smart. And they're very, very fit, very strong, very adept climbers. They got those claws. They got wicked eyesight and hearing and 
everything a wild animal would want. Top of all that, though, what puts them in like the extra, the extra level, if you will, is that they pass down information. So most animals teach their young things, but raccoons do this in an incredible way. So each generation is smarter than the one before. Each generation is more able to adapt and has all the wisdom of the generation before and then some. And it's actually got scientists. It was the raccoons that got scientists first to experiment with different animals to see if there's genetic memory. So in other words, they took some bunnies and they made them hate a certain kind of berry by giving them, you know, unpleasant experience around that berry. And then they had offspring and they had offspring and they tested all the offspring to see if they were still afraid of the berry that caused the unpleasant experience. And it turns out that even the grand babies of the in initial experiment bunnies, even their grand babies who had never met them, never had a chance to encounter this teaching, even they were afraid of this berry that the grandparents had been taught to fear. So it's very interesting. Does it pass through the genes? I think so. So the raccoon is going to be an extreme challenge for Tokyo. And I'm going to check back on that and find out what's going on later because uh, it's going to be something to see how they get rid of that. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were talking about, I was doing some celebrity gossip in one of the shows a few weeks ago and we were talking about um, Lionel Richie's daughter and Nicole Richie and how she and Paris Hilton had done these television shows. And when they were teenagers, they had pet rats and they many, many pet rats, and they named them all after the characters on 90210. I'm not a pet rat person. And I do notice that the people who love pet rats are very kissy cuddly with them, which I find difficult to watch, <laughs> admitting this as a pet expert. I've not yet made a bond with any rat or snake that makes me want to kiss or cuddle them. And I've had occasion where I had to give awards out. There was like a VIP award, very important pet award, and there was, you know, a dog who had rescued people from avalanches, gave him his medal and his year supply of Iams dog food. And then there was this other dog who uh, sniffed out things for the police in up to 80 feet of water, you know, like people who drowned or clothes that had been left by people. And so that dog, he was a great dog. He got to give him. And then the third winner is a snake. And I got to go hang a medal on this snake's neck and pretend to give it a kiss, sort of. And. Yeah, it just, it just wasn't the same feeling as hugging these dogs that help people. There was a cat there, too. And, um, you know, cats can be used to work. I know people are skeptical about that, but they can be used to work. And actually, I think we're going to go to the second break of the day. And when we come back, I'll talk about a little bit about working cats. And then I'm going to shift over to some orca news. So stay tuned for that on Animal Party at Life Radio. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Dot com. <laughs> Hello, you're back on Animal Party, Pet Life Radio. Okay, so does a cat ever have a job? Yes, some cats do have jobs. There are cats who live at old age homes and um, nursing homes. And there are cats who comfort the sick and the old. There are cats who comfort children at police stations during times of distress. I'm trying to think what other jobs. Oh, there, yeah, there's a good one. Here's a good one. This is a really technical job. So rats, interesting, we're still talking about rats. Rats are the best animals at finding landmines. They tunnel, they're smart, 
they can be trained really, really well to find the landmine and then alert the human so we can get rid of the landmine so innocent people and animals don't walk on it, right? After wars leave a, an area, oftentimes the devastation continues from these horrible things placed underground. So rats are really good at finding these and not getting hurt, finding them and coming back and reporting. They have cameras on their heads and they go and they tunnel and they find these landmines so the people can get rid of them. But the one problem is most of the rats are so afraid of being preyed on by a predator that they're only got half their mind on the job. So what they do is they take these rats when they're in training, after they've learned to find the bombs and everything, and they got their skill set all, all already, they put them with cats who don't hunt to get the idea that they don't have to worry if a predator is nearby. And so the cat, the rat will keep doing its job. Now, there's not going to be predators around when the humans are there and there's all this noise and bustle and they really needn't have half their mind worrying for a predator. But once they learn to work around sleeping cats, purring cats, grooming cats, cats who couldn't care less what the rats are doing, they stop worrying about the rats and the, uh, about the cats and the rats are able to do their job a lot better. So there's another job for cats. And I've also seen cats as hotel greeters. And I've seen cats get read to by kids with reading difficulties. So there's a few good jobs for cats out there. Don't dismiss the cat all the way. Now, I know they don't always want to work. And um, years ago, I used to do commercials. And I had a cat who I took for a Western Family cat food ad. I've had cats work for me before. And you have to pick the right cat. You have to pick a cat who's so, so busy, who always wants to do tricks and always wants your attention. And when you teach it something like its name, every time you say its name, it comes running. You have to pick the right, highly motivated, highly interested cat. If you have a cat like this, he's probably bugging you all the time. He's probably you know, trying to initiate play with you, trying to get interaction from you. He's probably looking in your eyes a lot. Try and teach him something. Like just a simple trick like sit. Say the word sit place him in a sit position and pet him. Do it like one more time. Then say sit and see if he does it. If your cat's super food rewarded, if he loves food, you could use some kind of food reward like a cat treat. Do the same thing. Say sit, place him in the sit position. Say sit, place him in the sit position. Stroke him, give him a treat. Say sit. If he sits, give him a treat. He's just learned sit. Now you might think, what is what's she talking about? She's saying to just do it twice. Yes. Cats are super smart and they get bored. If you do it too many times, you'll think your cat hasn't learned the trick because he'll ignore you because he thinks you're not worth listening to. If you underestimate a cat, he will stop working. So that's my first tip for cat training is keep, don't repeat too much and keep it moving. Keep it moving. Do one with dogs. I will often stay at a trick. I'll stay at it and stay at it and stay at it till the dog gets it. You know, keep, keep praising him and keep doing it. And then he gets it. Yes. And then do it one more time. Yes. And then I'll move on. But with a cat, mm -mm. if he's bored, move on to something else. Try something else. They really don't have the same attention span. So once your cat actually wants to please you and understands that training and tricks is fun and is kind of into the whole exercise, then you can go a little longer. But the first few times you work with a cat, you want to just do two repetitions, maybe three. And if the cat doesn't want to sit, for example, try something else. So say your cat is always pawing at you, pawing at you, pawing at you. Teach him to paw something else, like a bell. Teach him to ring a bell. And then you can hang that bell by the door. And he can ring that bell when he wants to go out instead of scratching. Yet there's so many ways to make cats interested in training that's helpful to us. Okay, so if you have cat questions, please send them to me. You can send me a voice clip at deb at petliferadio.com. Or just send a text or an email or anything at all with a question and I'll give you an answer. And you'll get your cat trained. Most of the time we train our cats to do the wrong thing. So the cat bugs you in the middle of the night, you get up and feed it. Well, now you're going to have a cat who bugs you every night. Every time it feels like eating, every time it's bored. It's going to think mealtimes are the middle of the night. So you've just trained it to do that. If instead you close your bedroom door and ignore it till the morning and feed him in the morning, He'll give up on the midnight, 3 a.m. wake-ups. They are naturally nocturnal. So teaching a cat that you are not nocturnal, it takes a little time. <laughs> they expect us to be up all night and sleep in the day. 
So we have to teach them that that's not our way. All right, please send me your cat questions, your dog questions, your suggestions, your why does my dog do this or why does my cat do this? And just going to talk about something that was in the news, orcas. Orcas have been sinking boats in the Strait of Gibraltar near Spain for about, well, a long time. It's been about 200 boats, and they just did it last weekend. Couple was rescued. Their boat, sailboat, was tanked. It just over and over and over. These orca whales just battered it. They just hit it and hit it and hit it till the thing went down. And people keep asking, well, is it play? Are they playing? Why are these whales so different than the rest of the whales in the world? Why is this one area such an area of conflict? And why do they keep hitting sailboats? Okay, well, first of all, I think, you know, take a step back. They're smarter than we are, or at least as smart as we are. So in, a lot of people have been saying, was it just play? And I would have to say, no chance. No chance is this play. These are extremely intelligent animals. When they sink a boat, they know what they've done. They know we need the boat. They know it's dangerous for us. They are trying to get those people off the water, out of their space. It's not about play. They know how to play. They're not playing with you. They're trying to get you out of their area. The question for me is more, what did we do? What sailboat, who in sailboats is pissing off the whales in the Strait of Gibraltar? Because they're targeting specific type of yacht, specific type of boat over and over and over again. So the first question is, is there something about those boats? Are they using some kind of sonar? Are they using some kind of alarms? Is there something irritating to the whales that this particular kind of yacht is transmitting that's, that they can't tolerate? That's my first question. And if we can't find any, any commonality there, the second question is, what idiot on a boat attacked the whales? When, where, what, and how do we show them that we're not all like that guy? How do we send a message of peace? Because they are trying to get every yacht and every sailboat out of their water. And that tells me something went wrong. Somebody shot them. Somebody pestered them. Somebody went too close. Somebody harassed them. Somebody hurt one of them. Something like that happened. And this particular family of whales is trying to protect itself from the future happening again. And I totally agree with them. So what do we do? And how do we figure out how to send the message that we're not there to hurt them? We need to send similar boats out with a message of peace. And, um, and that could be with, with fish. It could be. It could be a gift. It could be some significant gesture other than harassment. So I want to put that out there. We got to figure out what's going on there and, uh, and solve the problem. Hello, Kitty. Hello, Kitty opened in Vancouver. And I was really surprised to see that it was lined up around the block with not little kids. Lots and lots of men and women dressed in Hello Kitty outfits lining up around the block to uh, to shop at the first Hello Kitty store in Canada. I thought that was really strange. I was not in the lineup. <laughs> I would rather go to the cat cafe where they have actual cats, rescue cats, than Hello Kitty. But I do appreciate that it is quite the phenomenon for cat lovers. So if you're looking for a Hello Kitty store, you can find one in Vancouver now. And... I guess I want to end the show today just with, I guess, a story, a little, a little story from my own uh, experience here at Camp Good Dogs. So I've got the boarding kennel, and there were lots of dogs here for May long weekend. We had a big long weekend this week, and so many, many dogs came. And I had to send um, my beautiful teddy, cinnamon teddy bear, who's about eight or nine years old now, standard poodle. I had to send him down to the kennel to stay for a few days. He's still there because one of his wives and another female dog are up at my house with cone collars. You know, they got spayed and they have to wear the cone collar. And I don't really want Teddy to be, he loves these girls and he would probably try to clean them or lick their incision area or just harass them because they smell different. You know, they don't smell like they used to. They don't smell like his wife anymore. And so he would probably be a nuisance. So I sent him down to the kennel 
And the two cone dogs are doing fine. They've adjusted to their soft cones. I love the cone that I've got for them. And um, it's got Velcro attachments. And it's it's just, uh, it's much more pleasant than the hard plastic when it bumps into you, but also against their faces. And they got quite used to it. They're doing really well. One's still on antibiotics. The other one's done hers. Doing really, really well in their recovery. But there was a, a side effect of all this that I didn't even predict or foresee. I have a really old dog, a blue healer dog, who's got a cyst in the middle of his back. And the vets told me, just monitor it. If it doesn't do much, don't worry about it. He's old now. We won't, you know, it's okay. We'll just have a look at it every once in a while. Okay. And it didn't seem to be doing much. But I didn't realize the reason it didn't seem to be doing much is because the other dogs have been taking care of him. So now with Teddy gone and the two females in cone collars, they can't take care of him anymore. And so within three days of this happening, poor Blue had a big mess on his back and I had to clean it all up and he lost lots of hair and now he has a big bald spot. He looks like a George Costanza dog, the poor guy, or Friar Tuck with a big bald spot in the middle of his back. I didn't realize that these girl dogs were taking such good care of him and keeping him in such good condition. And when they got their phone collars, they stopped and the wound got really messy. So I've cleaned it all up and he's probably going to have to go to the vet next week for another recheck. But I just thought, you know, sometimes our dogs are doing good work and we don't even know it. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening today. Until next week, from me, Deb Wolf and Animal Party Pet Life Radio. Be good to your animals. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.